I've titled this message, The Blessings of Obedience, because today we will finally see God blessing the temple rebuilders and their leaders for returning to him and his, for returning him and his glory, excuse me, to the center of their priorities. We have a lot of territory to cover. We're going to move very fast. Let's ask for the Lord's help, and I hope you can keep up with me. Let's pray. Father, you've blessed us in these last six weeks with a time to explore your workings with your people, Israel. As we continue and finish this morning, we ask that your spirit would make our minds quick and our hearts soft, that your message may penetrate and do its good work in us. We pray this with thanks through your son. Amen. Well, as I always like to do, I want to start by giving you an overview of the territory we'll cover today. The overview will cover chronology, the message of the passages, and the key concepts that will come to the fore as we study. Now, let's talk about the chronology first. This morning, we're going to look at four different chunks of text, each one containing a different message from God for the rebuilders. Now, those chunks of text are Haggai chapter 2, verses 10 through 19, Haggai chapter 2, verses 20 through 23, and then Zechariah chapter 1, verses 1 through 6, and Zechariah chapter 3. Now, these passages actually interleave in time. The order in which they appear in your Bibles is not the order in which they were given in history and we need to get that sequence clear in our thinking before we start. Now flip over to the book of Zechariah. It comes right after Haggai, which is very convenient for us. Hold your finger in Zechariah chapter 1, and then turn back to Haggai chapter 2, verse 1. Now what you'll see is that the message we explored last week, Haggai chapter 2, 2 verses 1 through 9 was given in the seventh month of the second year of King Darius. Now look at Zechariah chapter 1 verse 1. You see that the message that's given there, a message that was brought through the prophet Zechariah, came in the eighth month of King Darius. Now turn to Haggai chapter 2. And look at verses 19 and, uh, let's see, is it 19? I'm sorry, Haggai chapter 2, verses 10 and 20. You'll see there that the messages that are recorded here were both delivered in the ninth month of King Darius. So in other words, Haggai proclaimed the messages, the two messages that we'll see in chapter 2, verses 10 through 23, after Zechariah gave the message that's recorded in the first part of chapter 1. Now, flip back to Zechariah chapter 1 and look at verse 7. Now, starting in this, in this section, Zechariah chapter 1, verse 7, Zechariah records a large number of visions that were given to him by God. It goes all the way through chapter 6 of Zechariah. We're not going to go through all of those. But I want you to look at the date in chapter 1, verse 7. It says, on the 24th day of the 11th month, the message came to Zechariah. Now, you can see that that is the last of the sequence of messages that we're going to look at. Let me put it together for you chronologically, and I think it'll be clearer for you. What we'd actually see is that God spoke to the temple rebuilders on five different occasions during the second year of King Darius as he motivated them to return to their mission of rebuilding the temple. The first batch of messages came in Haggai chapter 1, and that was in the sixth month. The second message came in Haggai chapter 2, verses 1 to 9, And that was in the seventh month. The third message came through Zechariah, 
And that's found in Zechariah chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. And that was in the eighth month. The fourth time that God sent messages, and there were two, that was in Haggai chapter 2, verses 10 to 23, and that was in the ninth month. And then the fifth occasion on which God sent messages to the people was in the 11th month, and that starts in Zechariah chapter 1, verse 7. So we've got the sixth month, the seventh month, the eighth month, the ninth month, and then for some reason God skipped the 10th month, and then we have the 11th month. Okay, so keep in mind that what we've been looking at is a sequence of messages that were delivered at intervals as God is working on the people to bring them back to obedience to him. Okay, now I want to give you a brief overview of each of the four messages that we're going to look at today, and I'm going to give them to you in the chronological order. The message of Zechariah chapter 1 verses 1 through 6 is very simple. God says, If you return to me, I will return to you. Now, the second message appears in Haggai chapter 2, verses 10 through 19, and we might summarize it like this. Your disobedience has defiled everything that you have done and has brought my curse upon you. But now that you have returned to me in obedience, I will bless you. The third message in Haggai chapter 2, verses 20 to 23, might be summarized like this. You, Zerubbabel, will one day be a ruler in Messiah's kingdom. And the fourth message, the one that we're going to look at in Zechariah chapter 3, might be summarized like this. Joshua, the high priest, the defiled high priest, whom I will cleanse, and the people whom he leads are a sign that Messiah is coming and that one day I will restore Israel's land and her people to my favor under the reign of the branch, the Messiah. Those are the four messages in a nutshell. Now, finally, let me give you a preview of the key ideas we'll encounter in our study this morning. One is a difficulty of interpretation and the other three concern the principles that we'll see today. Now, some of you may have picked up this difficulty of interpretation. Remember we saw in Ezra chapter 3 that way back in the year 536, the people laid the foundation of the temple and they rejoiced on that day. And you remember there were some people who wept and some people who were happy. Well, the problem is that when we come to Haggai chapter 2 verse 18, it says that the people laid the foundation of the temple on that day. And that's the year 520. And the question is, how could the temple have been laid in five, the foundation have been laid in 536 and again laid in 520? We'll sort that out. Okay, then there are three principles that we'll discover as we examine today's texts. The first principle is that God's blessings for obedience don't always come immediately. The second principle is that external appearances, especially spiritual appearances, can be deceptive. And the third principle is this. Even in hard times and even in dark days, God is working in the process that will bring the Messiah back to us. Well, let's look now at our passages. Keep in mind, because we're covering a lot of material, that we won't go as deeply as we have some time in the past. Turn with me to Zechariah chapter 1. Zechariah chapter 1. This is Zechariah's first message, and as we saw, it came in the eighth month. I'd like to read to you verses 1 through 6. In the eighth month of the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Iddo, the prophet, saying, The Lord has been very angry with your fathers. Therefore say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Do not be like your fathers to whom the former prophets preached, 
saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Turn now from your evil ways and your evil deeds. But they did not hear nor heed me, says the Lord. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? Yet surely my words and my statutes, which I command my servants, the prophets, did they not overtake your fathers? So they returned and said, and here Haggai is speaking of the people, I'm sorry, Zechariah is speaking of the temple rebuilders. So they returned and said, just as the Lord of hosts determined to do to us according to our ways and according to our deeds, so he has dealt with us. Now there's a lot we could say about this message, but I just want to hit three high points. Now, perhaps the most important idea expressed in God's word to the temple rebuilders is this. Return to me, and I will return to you. And to put it very simply, God is saying to his people, the reason we are not on good terms with each other is that you and your fathers departed from me. I never abandoned you. You abandoned me. And now I'm inviting you back into my good graces. Now, the second idea I want us to note is that the people to whom Zechariah was speaking, the temple rebuilders, these people, unlike the previous generations, responded to God in the right way, didn't they? Unlike their fathers, the generations that lived before him who who had rejected God and rejected his prophets, The temple rebuilders listened to and heeded Haggai and Zechariah. Now, the last idea we need to note here is that the people didn't make excuses for their sin. They didn't pretend that their circumstances, the failure of their crops, the difficulty they were having making a living, they didn't pretend that those things were merely accidental. They didn't blame their forefathers, although their forefathers were guilty. And they didn't pretend themselves to be without sin. They recognized that God's judgment upon them, the judgment that had taken the form of the difficulty that they had had making a living since the day that they stopped building until the prophets came, they recognized that that judgment was appropriate. That's why they said, just as the Lord of hosts has determined to do to us according to our ways, And according to our deeds, so he has dealt with us. Now, this idea is vitally important because the first step in getting right with God is always recognizing that you are not right with him. Turn with me now back to Haggai chapter 2. In my Bible, it's the same page. I don't even have to turn. The message that I'm about to read to you in Haggai chapter 2, verses 10 through 19, came to the temple rebuilders in the ninth month, about one month after the message that we just read. Now, there are really two parts to this message, verses 10 through 14, and then verses 15 through 19. So let's start by reading verses 10 through 14. On the 24th day of the ninth month in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet saying, thus says the Lord of hosts. Now ask the priest concerning the law saying, if one carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and with the edge he touches bread or stew, wine or oil or any food, will it become holy? And the priest answered and said, no. No. And Haggai said, if one who is unclean because of a dead body touches any of these, will it become unclean? So the priests answered and said, it shall be unclean. Then Haggai answered and said, so is this people and so is this nation before me, says the Lord. And so is every work of their hands and what they offer here is unclean. 
Now, when Haggai began to speak to the priests and he asked them these questions, I imagine they were thinking, boy, this is easier than theology 101. These questions are not difficult. In essence, God asked two questions. Is holiness contagious? The priests have the correct answer. No, it is not. And then God asked the second question. Is defilement contagious? And again, the priests have the correct answer. Yes, it is. The quiz was easy, but God's application of the answers was painful. God says, this people, this nation all their work and everything that they have offered to me here on the site of this temple is defiled. I want you to consider the scope of that statement. God says this people is defiled. He's speaking of all the temple rebuilders. He says this nation is defiled. He's speaking of all the Jews who were alive at that time, both the ones who had returned to the land to rebuild the temple and the ones who had remained back in Babylon, which is now the Persian Empire. But God's immediate concern is with the temple rebuilders, and he returns his focus to them. He says, every work of their hands and all that they offer here is defiled. Now think about this. The year is 520. It was 18 years earlier when this group of 42,000 men and their families returned to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. Two years after that, they had completed the laying of the foundation. According to Ezra 3, they began to offer sacrifices and offerings there on the temple site, and then disobedience set in. What did they do? They stopped building. They put God second in their priorities and they put themselves first. They built their paneled homes while God's temple lay unbuilt. When they stopped rebuilding, disobedience, their disobedience defiled everything that they offered to God. It didn't matter that they had come back to Jerusalem. It didn't matter that their offerings were being made on God's chosen site for the temple. It didn't matter that an official priest of Israel, a priest of the line of Aaron, dressed in the proper robes and following the proper procedure, presided over their offerings and sacrifices. The priest, the place, and even their good intentions could not sanctify what their disobedience had defiled. And so now we come to the second part of the message in verses 15 through 19. God says, And now carefully consider from this day forward, from before stone was laid upon stone in the temple of the Lord, since those days when one came to a heap of 20 ephahs, there were were but 10, when one came to the wine vat to draw out 50 baths from the press, there were but 20. I struck you with blight and mildew and hail in all the labors of your hands, yet you did not turn to me, says the Lord. Consider now, from this day forward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, from the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider it. Is the seed still in the barn? As yet the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have not yielded fruit. But from this day forward, I will bless you. Did you notice that God starts with a familiar phrase in verse 15? He says, carefully consider what I'm about to say to you. Remember in chapter 1, God said, Carefully consider, and we looked at the words, and it was apply your heart to your paths. The same idea is being used here. God says, apply your hearts to what I'm about to say. God is calling 
the temple rebuilders to listen to his words and to watch what he is about to do. On this very day, a date which he challenged them to write down, their fortunes would reverse. The frustration of their efforts to earn a living that had plagued them since they had returned to the land would suddenly give way to an unmistakable flood of tangible blessing. Their crops would grow abundantly. Their fruit trees would groan under the load of so much fruit. The grapevines would be black with grapes. The vats of olive oil and the casks of wine would soon be full with olives and grapes to spare. The purses, which had seemed to be full of holes, would soon be comfortably full. And just as God had cursed his people when they had neglected his house, now that they had turned back to him in obedience, he would richly bless them. Now, there may be a special significance to the date that God calls here this very day. There's a writer named J. Sidlow Baxter. I only know of one book that he wrote. There may be others. I use it all the time. It's called Explore the Book. Some of you may know of it. In that book, Baxter argues that this day is exactly 70 years of 360 days from the day upon which the siege of Jerusalem began. Now, what's interesting about that is the day on which the siege of Jerusalem began is the first date in the Old Testament that is given to the exact day. And that date is recorded three times. It's recorded in Jeremiah 25, Ezekiel 24, and 2 Kings 25. Now, I tried to do the arithmetic to verify whether what Baxter says is true. And it's not easy to do. But when I do the calculation, I come out that the time between the day upon which the siege of Jerusalem began and this date in Haggai chapter 2 is within 25 days exactly 70 uh, 70 years of 360 days apiece. Now, you may know that in the Bible, the year was typically used as 360 days, and then there would be corrections. And if you look at the error... It's one one one-hundredth of a percent of an error from exactly 70 years, okay? I'm not sure that that's what's going on, but if nothing else, it's a fascinating coincidence. The point, the big point, is that God says, because you have returned to obedience to me, today I'm going to turn the switch and all the things that you had been pursuing, that were cursed, will now be blessed. Now, there's really only one difficulty in this message that I see that's worth mentioning. It's that difficulty we noted earlier. Take a look at verse 18. God says, Consider now from this day forward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, from the day that the foundation of the temple, of the Lord's temple was laid. Consider it. Well, here's the problem. Ezra chapter 3, which we read a number of weeks ago, said that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid back in 536. Remember that? Here, it seems to be saying that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid on this date in the year 520. How do we make sense of this? Is this a contradiction in Scripture? I don't think so. There are two possible ways to approach this that I know of. The first one is that when in verse 18, God says, consider from this day forward, from the 24th day of the month, from the day that the temple foundation was laid, he's saying, think back today over how things have been since the day that the temple's foundation was laid back in 536. Okay? That's one possibility. Basically, God is saying, I'm blessing you today because, I'm sorry, God is not saying I'm blessing you today because today you finished building the foundation of the temple, but rather, as I bless you today, I want you to think back to the day on which it was completed. 
That's one possible solution, but the problem for me with this is that both verse 15 and 18 seem to be saying that it's today, it's this day, the 24th day of the ninth month in the year 520, that the foundation was completed. Now, the second solution is a little more subtle. It's just something I kind of ran into as I was looking at the Hebrew text, and I am not a Hebrew scholar, so if I get this wrong, my apologies to those of you who are. What I noticed is that the form of the verb used in Ezra 3.10, where it says that the foundation of the temple was laid and the form that's used here in Haggai 2.18, when it says that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, there are two different forms of the verb. And the form that's used in Ezra is a form that generally refers to preparation, whereas the form that's used here in Haggai refers to completion. It may be that what happened back in the year 536 that's recorded in Ezra chapter 3 was essentially the groundbreaking for the foundation. And what happens here in Haggai chapter 2 is the completion of the actual foundation. So the concrete is poured and everything is laid out and they're ready to build the building on top of that. I'm not sure which of these two solutions is correct. But what I can say for sure is that on the 24th day of the ninth month, God made an announcement to the rebuilders. God says, today, this very day, you will see a dramatic and measurable reversal of your fortunes. When you see this happening, don't think it's an accident. It's me blessing you for your obedience, just as I had cursed you earlier for your disobedience. Now, it's not recorded, but I imagine that when Haggai spoke these words, a cheer went up from the crowd. And if this had been in Texas, there would have been hats in the air everywhere. This was good news. And no doubt, the promise of blessing and God's fulfillment of that promise propelled the people forward. They continued the process And we know from the historical books that the temple was completed four years later in the year 516 B.C. and dedicated. Let's move on now to the third message in Haggai chapter 20, uh, chapter 2, excuse me, verses 20 through 23. Let me read that to you. Again, the word of the Lord came to Haggai on the 24th day of the same month, speaking, uh, saying, Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I will shake heaven and earth. I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I will destroy the strength of the Gentile kingdoms. I will overthrow the chariots and those who ride in them. The horses and their riders shall come down, each one by the sword of his brother. In that day, says the Lord of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, my servant, son of Shealtiel, says the Lord, and I will make you a signet ring, for I have chosen you, says the Lord of hosts. Now, there's much that we could examine here, but our time will limit us. The basic message is simple. God is again predicting the shaking the time of judgment of which he had already spoken earlier in verses 6 through 9 of this chapter. Is this driving you nuts? It's driving me nuts. Earlier, God had said that as a result of this shaking, the nations would bring their wealth to God's future temple and peace would come to Jerusalem. Here, God adds the information that that shaking will also bring about the destruction of the military power of the Gentile nations. And now God adds a special promise for Zerubbabel. He says, I will make you a signet ring. Now, I think you all know what a signet ring was in the ancient world. A signet ring was a symbol of executive authority. Remember how in the book of Genesis, Pharaoh gave his signet ring to Joseph to place Joseph in authority over all the kingdom. 
In the book of Esther, King Ahasuerus gave his signet ring to Mordecai to give him power to make decrees in all of the kingdom in order to protect the Jews. Now here, God predicts that in Messiah's future kingdom, Zerubbabel, as a resurrected Jewish saint, will have a special role as an executive under the Messiah as a reward for his service in rebuilding the temple. Now, what I'm saying to you may sound different than what you've heard before. Many expositors, perhaps most of them, look at this passage and they argue that God is not really speaking of Zerubbabel. He is looking at Zerubbabel, but he's seeing the Messiah himself. That may be true, but personally, I think this idea of being a signet ring can be taken very plainly. I think God is telling Zerubbabel in Messiah's future kingdom, the kingdom that I will establish on earth when I shake the nations and I send my son back to rule. In that kingdom, you will be an executive serving under the authority of Messiah. Basically, I think God is promising that Zerubbabel, like every other believer, will rule and reign with Christ in his future millennial kingdom. Well, our time is running short. Let's turn over to Zechariah chapter 3. Zechariah chapter 3. The message here has two parts, and we're going to look at each one very briefly. First of all, in verses 1 through 8, Zechariah has a vision of the cleansing of Joshua, and the Joshua spoken of here, of course, is the high priest whom we know. Listen to verses 1 through, let's see, 1 through 7. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand a smoking stick plucked from the fire. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and was standing before the angel. Then he answered and spoke to those who stood before him, that's the angel, saying, take away the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, see, I have removed your iniquity from you and I will clothe you with rich robes. And I said, let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and they put the clothes on him and the angel of the Lord stood by. Then the angel of the Lord admonished Joshua saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, if you will walk in my ways and if you will keep my command, then you shall also judge my house. And likewise have charge of my courts. I will give you places to walk among those who stand here. Now the Joshua of whom we are reading was the high priest whom we know well. This Joshua had presided over sacrifices and offerings made on the temple site from the day recorded in Ezra chapter 3 in the year 536 all the way down to the time when God sent Haggai and Zechariah to motivate the people to take up the building project again. Now, all through that time, no doubt, Joshua had worn the expensive and the impressive robes that were appropriate to his office. But from God's viewpoint, Joshua was dressed in filthy rags in the spiritual realm Joshua was dirty, defiled, and half-naked. Then God sent Haggai and Zechariah. They called Zerubbabel and Joshua and all the people to repentance, and they called them back to obedience to God. God's words to them, build my house, did not fall on deaf ears this time. They obeyed. They took up their tools. They got to work. And God responded by blessing his people, didn't he? He promised to them that he would reverse their fortunes, and he did. He promised Zerubbabel that one day he would be a signet ring in Messiah's kingdom. 
And here, he spiritually cleanses Joshua so that his service in the new temple, which will soon be completed, will be acceptable. And he gives him charge over the new temple. Now, Zechariah's vision continues, and in that vision, he delivers a promise from God in verses 8 down through 10. Listen to those. Hear, O Joshua the high priest, you and your companions who sit before you, for they are a wondrous sign. For behold, I am bringing forth my servant, the branch, For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua, upon the stone are seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave its inscription, says the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that city in one day. In that day, says the Lord of hosts, everyone will invite his neighbor under his vine and under his fig tree. The promise that's made here is not just for Joshua, but it's for Zerubbabel and all the people who are present. Allow me to paraphrase briefly what God is saying to them. He says, you are signs, you are visible evidences that I am at work and that I am in charge of the events of history, past history, present history, and future history. Your very existence and the fact that you are fulfilling my will as you rebuild my house are signs that what I have promised in the past, I will fulfill in the future. My servant, the branch of whom I spoke to you earlier in the writings of Jeremiah and Isaiah, will come as I have promised. In the future day when he arrives... I will cleanse this land and this people of iniquity in a single day. In that day, the day when the branch begins to rule the future kingdom of Messiah, every one of you will live in peace and prosperity. You and your neighbors will rejoice as you enjoy the blessings that I've promised to you in the covenants. You, every last one of you, from the smallest to the greatest. You who were tempted to despise the day of small beginnings, you who began the temple project and then gave it up and have now taken the work up again, you are signs that I will do all that I have promised. Now, time forces us to come to a conclusion soon. There's so much more that we could observe in these four texts that we've looked at today. But I want to finish by making a few observations, and we will conclude our series on the book of Haggai. Three principles come to mind as I reflect on today's texts. Now, the first principle that I see is this. God's blessing for obedience does not always come immediately, and there's a flip side to this principle. God's discipline for sin and disobedience does not always come immediately. Now, it's hardly necessary to prove the truth of this statement, is it? We've surveyed Israel's history, and we've seen in that history the immense patience of our God. He waited years, and in some cases decades and even centuries, before disciplining his people for sin. God had told Moses in Exodus chapter 34, verse 6, that he is merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abounding in goodness and truth. Our study in the book of Haggai has also shown us that God does not always immediately reward obedience. For the temple rebuilders, it was not until three months after they had resumed the work that God said, From this day forward, I will bless you. And we ourselves, as members of the body of Christ, know that many of our blessings, the blessings that we anticipate, perhaps most of them, 
will not come to us until we are in the actual presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the reason I bring this principle to mind is this. If it's true that God does not always discipline our sin immediately, and if it's true that God does not always bless our obedience immediately, then we would be fools to try to gauge our walk with God by examining our circumstances. Don't assume that when you are being blessed, this means that God is pleased with how you are living. And don't assume that when you are suffering, that means that God is displeased with you. Don't look at others and try to use the gauge of blessing to evaluate their spiritual status. There's only one way that we can truly know whether God is pleased with us, and that is by comparing our lives and our hearts to his written word. Now, the second principle that I see in today's text is very closely related to the first one. External appearances can be deceiving. And what I have in mind in particular is spiritual appearances. Let me explain what I mean. Think back to that day. We've already mentioned it today. The day when in Ezra chapter 3, the people who had returned to rebuild the temple began to offer their sacrifices and offerings on the temple site. It was the year 536. For nearly 50 years, since the day in 586 when the temple had been destroyed, until that day in 536, no sacrifices or offerings had been made by the people of Israel. Then the people returned to Jerusalem following the decree of Cyrus. And in 536, they began to offer sacrifices and offerings again. They must have felt a great wave of joy on that day, realizing that they were starting something that had not gone on for 50 years. For the first time in 50 years, there was a priest in Jerusalem wearing the proper robes, offering sacrifices according to the rules laid out in the law. It didn't matter that it was outdoors on the bare ground where the temple had once stood. Surely the people must have felt that their sacrifices and offerings and praises that they offered on that day and continue to offer from that day forward were holy and acceptable to God. But the reality was, as we have seen today, that nothing they offered was holy or acceptable to God. It was all defiled because they were defiled. Their disobedience defiled them. It rendered everything that they touched and all that they did defiled in the eyes of God. Now, generalizing, we might observe that believers who appear on the outside to be pleasing God may, in fact, be defiled because of unseen or unrecognized sin. Well, God then brought a message through Haggai and Zechariah, and everything changed. The people still brought the same sacrifices and offerings. Joshua still wore the same robes. The outside spiritual appearance was really very much the same, but the inside spiritual reality was different, wasn't it? It It's because the people confessed their sin repented of their sin and returned to obedience. What had been defiled before, the people, their offerings, and their work was now clean and holy and delightful to God. I hope we learn a lesson from the experience of the temple rebuilders. Let us never forget that spiritual appearances can be deceiving. Now, the last principle that I'd like to call our attention to is this. Even in hard times, even in days that seem insignificant, God is working to bring about the return of the Messiah, the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, the day about which we sang 
before we turn to our text this morning. I hope you found this series on the book of Haggai interesting. I hope you found it even compelling. Personally, I think it's a fascinating story, and there's much more to be seen than what we have discussed. But I want to ask you a blunt question. Do you think that anybody in the world today besides us Christians gives a hoot or a holler about what happened between the years of 536 and 516 B.C. in the Middle East? I don't think so. I don't think they care. Personally, I doubt that very many people who were living outside of Jerusalem, even while these events were transpiring, cared very much. The fact of the matter is that the world cares very little, in fact, has no concern or thought for what is happening in God's plan. And I think that what God is doing often, in fact, most of the time, seems not only insignificant, but utterly unimportant. But the truth is that the seemingly insignificant events that took place under the ministry of Haggai and Zechariah were extremely important in God's plan. The feeble efforts of a small group of relatively poor Jews to build a rather unimpressive temple bear a significance that is entirely out of proportion to appearances. They bear importance because God gave them importance. They bear importance because God used the feeble feeble efforts of insignificant people to provide a sign of his future intentions. They bear importance because they're a link in a chain of events that God is bringing to pass that will lead to the certain and unstoppable return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I close our series on the book of Haggai with a simple reminder drawn from the principles that we've seen in this book. Don't underestimate your personal importance in God's plan. And let us not underestimate our corporate importance in God's plan. Remember that your obedience is important to God and that he will discipline you to gain your obedience if necessary. Remember that the temporary absence of blessing in your life does not necessarily mean that God is displeased with you. Remember that seemingly insignificant people like us are often extremely important to God. And remember that you and I, as servants of the living God, and all that we do in his service are indispensable links in the divinely ordained chain of events that will lead to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. May he make us faithful in our generation as the temple rebuilders were in their generation. Let's pray. Father, we don't feel like important people outside the walls of this church among unbelievers, I doubt that anybody is giving us a thought. But it's not their opinion that matters. It's yours. And your opinion is not mere opinion, Father, because you are the creator and the owner of the universe. Father, we long to be more obedient to you, to be more perceptive to your will for us, to be more conformed to that will and to be more active in your service. Father, if we need to be awakened, please do so. If we are walking in sin, please reveal it and convict us. And in the times, Father, when by your grace and the work of your spirit and the guidance of your word, we are serving you in a way that pleases you. Enable us to know that and rejoice in it. Above all, Father, we pray that you would continue your plan to the day when the Lord Jesus comes back and that you would enable us 
on that day to look back and to rejoice and to say that we did our part by the grace of God. Amen.